Hi, I'm Guy Wallace. I was discussing analysis the other day with a colleague, someone I've known for well over 30 years, part of my professional society, NSPI, that became ISPI back in the mid-90s, uh, the International Society for Performance Improvement. And she and I were discussing the importance of analysis and uh, the various approaches to analysis. And I was sharing that uh, I was uh, taught a derivative of a derivative of a Gary A. Rumler approach to instructional analysis, a performance-based instructional analysis back in the fall of 1979 when I joined the ISD world out of college. Um, but I was thinking while we were talking that even as important, sometimes even more important than the analysis and uh, the data that's generated, you know, the accuracy, completeness, and appropriateness of the analysis data, I often think that something is even more important, getting started off on the right foot. And uh, in my approach to what's typically known as ADDI, uh, my model is a little bit different. I frame uh, project planning and management of uh, ISD projects a little bit differently. And my, I always start off with project planning and kickoff as the very first phase. And in that phase, which uh, starts with an intake process, where we want to understand what the request is and clarify that and you know test our understanding and do active listening etc so that the requester knows that we understand exactly what they're looking for and and the situation and the reasons why uh, we would then move into a stage two to investigate that further with other stakeholders uh, the business leaders that are to be most impacted by an instructional effort um, and that leads then to the development of a project plan and I always try to convince my clients to form a project steering team a PST you can call it whatever you'd like but uh, the intent is to organize the client the customers uh, not the learners but the learners management at a high enough level so that they can approve the effort and resource the effort with the right people, the right resources that are required. And I like to resource my projects primarily with master performers, people doing the job to a level of mastery the day before I met them, uh, met with them to uh, elicit from them, you know, all of their secrets, you know, how do they do what they do? And because we want to teach everybody else to become a master performer or uh, be on the road to mastery as quickly as effectively and as efficiently as possible. So the project steering team to me is key and critical. And in my 41 years of doing instructional systems design type projects, those that failed often failed because there was no project steering team where my client was hesitant to share the decision making uh, didn't want to bother the uh, stakeholders, was going to act on their behalf, and oftentimes didn't have the insights to the real business issues, the real business metrics to be affected, didn't know who the real master performers were, didn't realize what other subject matter experts might be brought into an effort like this. For example, if the regulations are going to be changing, the business leaders uh, that are going to be affected by the instruction possibly more than likely know that there's coming down the pike regulatory changes or other kinds of changes and they can help make sure that the instruction that's produced is good not just for the past but for the future the near-term future or as long as possible um, depending on the volatility of their world and they know that and oftentimes the requester does not and so if a requester is gun shy about uh, engaging other leaders to affect the project in a positive manner, those leaders often suffer the consequences of having instruction produced that isn't really worthy. It doesn't address the authentic performance requirements. It doesn't understand the current state gaps and their probable causes. Um, it, it, in, even if the Stakeholders can't uh, remedy the situation, can't remove barriers. My approach to instruction 
is to understand what's the ideal performance and then what are the common gaps of the non-master performers, you know, what are the barriers that they face, because I want to know what the strategies and tactics are of the master performers for avoiding the barriers in the first place and what they do in the second place if those barriers are unavoidable. So they all have strategies and tactics that uh, make them master performers. They may not be perfect, but they get the job done and they get the job done well, and they're recognized by their own leadership. And so it's important to have that leadership involved on the project steering team so that the voice of the customer predominates. Um, just because we can uncover a valid training need doesn't warrant meeting that. And leaders know what's where they're going to get returns, whether they're dollarizable or not. What's the uh, uh, strategic uh, initiatives that are going on in the organization that need to be reflected or not in the instruction that we're undertaking? So having them at the helm, so to speak. I like to tell the project steering team that uh, I've given them a command and control mechanism. And then the second time I make uh, reference that, I always say command and control and empowerment because you are empowering me and the people that you handpick to be on the analysis team, on the design team, and on the development team, and we go through the project, um, and maybe that's all in one uh, swift effort um, uh, where we're doing rapid development, but it's based on people who understand uh, what the analysis would tell us in terms of what are the tasks, what are the outputs, what are the requirements uh, from various stakeholder groups that must be met and complied with, what are the barriers, etc., and then how do we best uh, convey the instruction, job aids and or training, to the target audience? You know, what's realistic, what's feasible in their performance context, and, you know, there's no sense producing job aids for a target audience that has to have things at the ready, memorized, or skills ready to go when there's no time to reference anything. And so there's time and a place for job aids or performance support, and there's a time and a place when that's totally inappropriate. So as we're dealing with uh, creating instruction, job aids and training, that will impact performance, we need to have the best inputs possible. Now, I've never been one who truly believed that I could do interviews, and observations and do document reviews and walk away from all of that with enough of an understanding to produce stellar instruction. Content that's accurate, complete, and appropriate. I can take my best guess, but it's I need master performers and other subject matter experts in the process. And uh, just because somebody's a master performer or there's a group of them and you get them to consensus doesn't make them right. What we know from the research is that experts uh, can only give you th about 30% of what a novice would need. And so if you're working with a team of master performers and other subject matter experts, collectively they might get you up to 85% of what a novice needs. And you're really gonna have to work really hard. You're gonna have to do a lot of uh, alpha testing, beta testing, pilot testing in order to find where are the holes in the content and perhaps you need to release that content and be ready to do continuous improvement as additional issues are found. Now, when I'm working with master performers and other subject matter experts, I find that the content that they give me is, for the most part, accurate. But what I've learned and what I've observed uh, because of my approach to all of this is that the content is incomplete because I see continuous improvements, additions, modifications made to the content as we go through the process, all the way from project planning and kickoff through the analysis phase where we're really trying to understand what the performance is and what the enabling knowledge and skills are, through the design process where all that data is added to. When we get into development, we're, where that's where we're really going uh, deep in analysis to get down all the micro tasks, both behavioral and cognitive, so that that can be uh, formulated uh, and as part of the instruction, part of the training or job aids to uh, develop the skills, the knowledge and skills that people need uh, that are authentic to their performance requirements back on the job. So the project steering team, uh, I, I meet with them after certain key phases, not every phase, uh, 
to do a, what's called a gate review meeting in other uh, areas and engineering efforts and such, project management areas. There's a lot of different names for these kinds of things. So I, I conduct a gate review meeting to review the project plan with them at the end of the project planning and kickoff phase, and that therein is the kickoff. And if they approve it or modify it, uh, we know what we're going to do going forward. And they can then resource that with the appropriate people. They can guide us to the appropriate documents. They can tell us what situations we may want to observe or not. But they're going to impact the quality of the analysis data by who they target us to work with. Uh, there's no sense working with people who really aren't master performers um, or the right subject matter experts. Uh, it's not a question of just working with any warm body, not if you're working on high stakes performance. And that's, I, for me, if it's not high stakes performance, it perhaps probably should be informal learning. And let them figure it out by hook or by crook and let's not resource this and spend a whole bunch of uh, money uh, converting shareholder equity, uh, their cash into content if it's not gonna have a sufficient return. Um, and that's a business orientation and this and the project steering team also assures us when we're going to have that right business impact focus. If you can identify 10 major things uh, that people do in the job, the project steering team might say six of those are really critical and important, and the other four are uh, could be called uh, low-hanging fruit, and we don't need to address those kinds of things. Now, it may not be obvious to an instructional designer doing the analysis work when they've uncovered 10 different outputs with task sets associated with each one. They might treat them all as equal. Um, and this is important when you get into the design because if, if you're going to, if you were to cover all 10 of those and four of them are the low hanging fruit, you're going to just make a quick reference to them and let it go at that. On the other six, you're going to provide information leading to demonstration, leading to application exercises, practice with feedback, corrective and reinforcing feedback. And oftentimes, because of the critical nature of the high stakes performance, you're going to do more than one practice exercise for each worthy output you might do two or three or four or five, depending on how critical, how tricky it is, how complex that performance is. I like to start off with um, easy peasy application exercises and then move into things that are difficult and then move into things that are darn difficult. And then the fourth level is the uh, application exercise from Hades. Um, and depending on the performance context and the variation in the performance context, Perhaps there's more than one difficult type of performance. Uh, maybe the environmental uh, variables are different in several uh, applications. And so maybe there's gonna be three or four application exercises from Hades where they are darn tough, as authentic, as bad as it could be back out on the job. And if we're trying to prepare people to go back out on the job and we want the tr learning to transfer and have a positive impact, then we're gonna probably have to go that last mile to authentic performance applications, and we're gonna probably have to have more than one shot at practice with feedback. Um, and your clients oftentimes strip that kind of stuff out because they don't see that as worthy. And I have that command and control and empowerment mechanism, the project steering team gate review meeting so that I can work with them and argue with them, debate with them, the worthiness of actually having people practice these key and critical skills. Now, they may not like the fact that that takes their uh, training content from, you know, one size to five times longer than what they were expecting. But if I, and if I can't make a rational business case as to why that's necessary, then they're probably right and I'm probably wrong. But if I can make a worthy case about the worth, the possible impact to performance back out on the job, when I can reduce error rates, I can increase productivity, I can uh, reduce costs inherent in problematic work performance back on the job, um, then I have a chance at really creating a learning design experience that's authentic, focused on high stakes performance, that's going to transfer back to the job and it's gonna have a significant impact. 
And because of uh, my belief that it's all about performance, it's not all about learning, even in a learning organization. This is Guy Wallace. Thank you very much.